So I've just finished writing my epic uh, Bruce Springsteen box set review. I've covered it in as much detail as I can possibly cover it and not in a short kind of like uh, perfunctory way. And you know, one of the things I've that I really love about this job is that it forces you to reconsider things that you've thought about and, and thought you had made your conclusions on. And one thing, one artist that I have had to do that for is Bruce Springsteen having to review this box. So I had to go back and listen to all these records, uh, some of which I, I didn't really own, and uh, some of which I didn't think I really liked. And the fact of the matter is, uh, I was never a big Bruce Springsteen fan. And, you know, and some people are saying, what, you're not a Bruce Springsteen fan? And others are saying, yeah, me neither. It's like uh, the Beatles. I, I know people that are not Beatles fans. I can't even imagine that. So I imagine some people are saying, you don't like Bruce Springsteen? Are you crazy? And I live in New Jersey. That's just the way it is. And um, But now that I've gone through this box, I have a totally different opinion as you can tell by from what I wrote. And um, so I actually like a lot of this stuff. And I didn't like it because I didn't really give it a chance. And I didn't give it a chance because I had this um, kind of prejudice because I really didn't like a lot of the first couple of records. I, I just for a whole bunch of reasons. It's just one of those things. It hits you a certain way and you form a conclusion and then you don't revisit it because you get like, you know, like all this other stuff to listen to, you know, and you don't go back. Now I was forced to go back and listen to the box. I still think the recordings are just for the most part really awful and um, I don't know what what they were thinking about and I don't know what Springsteen was thinking about and his producer was thinking about all that hazy uh, reverb and drenched harsh I, I don't get any of that it makes the listening very unpleasant but that's a secondary to the music I mean some of these records some of these tunes I think he should go back and re-record them you know go back to the power station go back go back to a good studio record it all analog mix it down get rid of all that stupid reverb and and, and revisit some of these great songs anyway that's just a secondary thing so uh, you know sometimes you have to do penance so what I want to do now is um, is read something that I wrote uh, about 20 years ago about Bruce Springsteen. It's some of the stupidest shit you could <laughs> you could ever imagine, uh, and I just want to read it because uh, it'll humiliate me and make me look stupid. And I don't mind being humiliated. I don't mind looking stupid because that's the only way you can really uh, grow to a different level. So this so this is um this is what I wrote in uh, in in an old issue of the Absolute Sound, which. Uh, Amazingly, I was prescient enough back in 1980, uh, what was it, 87, to know about the internet. So when I negotiated my deal with the late Harry Pearson, I, I kept all the rights to what I wrote um, in, back in 1987 for my own use on the internet. So here's what I wrote, okay? Um, I was about six years old when Elvis came along. I felt the heart of rock and roll. The heart went out in the early 60s, so I got into jazz, then folk. In 1962, when Bob Dylan came to my attention in high school, my eyes were again opened wide. A year later, I heard the Beatles for the first time, and the magic struck again. I responded to and understood the enormity, the enormous popularity of the big ones, except for Bruce Springsteen. I can't, for the life of me, figure out what the fuss is about. He, was always, he has always reminded me of a made-for-television movie. How's that? I'm not convinced of the reality. I find his voice unbearably two-dimensional and frequently possessed of a particularly guttural and ugly tone. It's amusical to me. The only thing I was moved to do by Bruce's performance in We Are the World was to clear my throat. The band is tight, to use an appropriate cliche, but anonymous and utterly without character, save for Roy Bitten, whose piano playing is usually too precious for anything I care to call rock and roll, and Clarence Clemens' sax playing rivals Leo Kotke singing. If you don't know what that means, position yourself behind a flatulent duck sometime. <laughs> And enough with that damn glockenspiel already. At least Phil Spector knew when to stop. But you have to see him live, I was told by supporters. So when my pal Bud Scop at Music Connection offered to take me to see the boss at the Los Angeles Coliseum on the final night of his tour, I accepted. To get into the spirit of things, I donned a shoulder-length blonde wig, a beat-up Pendleton plaid over a t-shirt, some ripped fly button jeans, and a pair of greasy sneakers. Actually, that's how I dress now. So, so I don't know what I was thinking in 1987. To complete the image of a Southern Californian working class chic, I put on one of those surfer boy afro picks in my hair. I didn't really do any of this. In my back pocket, I went around saying, 
Hey, Bruce is bitching, dude. In my best Nasal Valley Boy dialect. They really do talk like that. We had great seats for a Coliseum. As the lights went down, Donnie Osmond arrived, and after a series of grinning 360s till everyone noticed him, took a seat next to me. That was true. My God, I thought, I'm sitting next to Donnie Osmond at a Bruce Springsteen concert. That's when I decided I better leave Los Angeles. Sitting among 90,000 screaming fanatics while you're not feeling a mild buzz is a very strange feeling. You keep asking yourself, why don't I get this? You look around at the people caught up in frenzied adulation, and you say, I know how they feel. I, I reacted this way when I saw the Stones in my college gymnasium in 1965, or when I saw Dylan in the band. I reacted like these Boss fans when I saw Brian Ferry tongue firmly in cheek swagger across the stage in a tuxedo, or when Bowie dropped from the ceiling at Radio City in that ridiculous outfit with the four-foot bell-bottoms. Stevie Woman and Van Morrison get the blood flowing. Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Peter Gabriel, live last year, provided the same intense experience as Jagger in 65. But this... I found the going ponderous, plotting, and obvious. If John Lennon was a working-class hero, it was because he transcended his background. Springsteen wallows in it. He's a panderer. How else do you characterize a guy who wraps an American flag around his album? I know that Born to Run isn't the appeal to blind patriotism Reagan thought it was. The album cover is. Interestingly, the most enjoyable moments in the concert for me were during Bruce's spoken reminiscence-ings which were simple-minded, almost goofy, like a good-natured Sylvester Stallone, but heartfelt. Boy, that's nice. During those raps, it was so quiet you could hear the cars out on the Harbor Freeway. Springsteen had this audience completely under control. I imagined I was back in high school in the auditorium and I wanted to just stand up and yell, yell out, Hey, why are you paying so much attention to that goofy guy? There's got to be someone in this place who has something interesting or enlightening to say. I thought in 1962 there probably was some, somebody just like Springsteen around, but people couldn't be bothered with him because Bob Dylan was there. But now there isn't anyone like Dylan around. Well, there is, but people are too busy with Bruce to notice. So look, if you're a Springsteen fan, you've already got the record. And by the way, the record I was I was writing about was Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band Live, 1975 to 1985. Bruce Springsteen, John Lando, Chuck Block, and producers, Toby's Got Engineers, Columbia C5X40558. Um, so look, if you're a Springsteen fan, you've already got the record, and you think I'm a stiff or a shit. I wrote stiff here, but you must think I'm a shit. In fact, by now, you've probably said to yourself, this guy's a fucking egomaniac. He's talking more about himself than the record. Okay, so the record. I have no idea. I have no idea. Spring Team Fanatics say there's glaring omissions. I don't know what they are. They also say there should have been earlier versions of many of the songs because by the time these stadium takes, uh, the time of these stadium takes, Bruce was bored with them. Maybe so. Anyway, on side 10 is more evidence to, my, to back my contention that the superiority... <laughs> now I get back to digital analog. Anyway, on side 10 is more evidence to back my contention that the superiority of digital recording is the greatest single case of mass hypnosis since the election of Ronald Reagan. Sorry, right-wingers. The next to the last cut on the record is 10th Avenue Freeze Out, recorded digitally at the Meadowlands Arena, where I live, 824-84. On that song, the recording is uniformly bright and strident. Sibilants are actually louder and bigger than any other part of Springsteen's voice. The band is somewhere in the front of you, plastered against the wall. As the song ends, the audience applauds. But do you hear a hand clapping? No. You hear tap, 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 tap of the skin hitting, and then you hear the cupping component of applause as totally separate entities. Never in the so as is the sonic picture of people clapping generated, nor that of the crowd. Crowd. Then there is a seg to Jersey Girl, recorded in the same arena, analog, 7981. There's no increase in hiss or squash dynamics or head bump sound or any other of analog's terrible sins, but all of a sudden, you see the hands clapping, you feel the space where they're clapping from, you feel the stage in front of you, in front of them, and all of a sudden, there's a band in three dimensions, and the bass sounds like a bass, not some mealy, wormy, low-frequency nudge. Bruce is standing in front of the band, a concept the digital recording doesn't know from. I realize the whole package was digitally mastered and that if digital was so bad, it should have, in that step, erased all depth in the analog originals. What I know is what I hear. I can only surmise that Sony's digital mastering isn't as bad as Sony's digital multi-track recording, which is what we also heard on the uh, the River album. But I wouldn't be the first to notice that. But then I wouldn't be the first to notice yet that. Blah, blah. Have you noticed how, via Steve, how vile Stevie Wonder's recordings have become since Sony gave him a digital studio? I didn't write this, but the same with Paul McCartney's Tug of War. Feh! The analog recordings in this album, incidentally, are some of the finest live sessions I've heard. Bob Clearmountain did a great job mixing them, although Springsteen's voice is sometimes peaky and strident at the top. If being a Bruce, at a Bruce Springsteen concert is your idea of a good time, this set, most fans tell me, is for you. That's what I wrote. So, 
pretty lame. A lot of it is really lame. I don't know what made me so angry. I don't know. I guess it was the fact that I didn't get Bruce at all, and I couldn't understand the adulation, so I got mad, you know, as if I don't have better things to get mad at. Anyway, so now that I've had a chance to digest this box, I like a lot of it. I like a hell of a lot of it. I have completely... Uh, I completely take back everything that I that I said there and, and other places, and uh, I'm going to be listening to a lot of this in the future. So um, that's all I have to say. My bad. I don't know what I was thinking. And uh, thank you, and good night.